This meeting is being recorded. Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, The Digital Supplier Market is Holding Local Government Back and How Low Code and RPA are Enabling Councils to Break Free and Innovate. My name is Lucy Wakeford, I'm Director of Programmes at Digital Leaders and it's my pleasure to be chairing this session. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd firstly like to recap the topic, just to give anyone who might be running late a chance to join. Data and the ability to move it in a friction-free way out, and, out of and between different software applications to support digital transformation is often trapped, held hostage even, in Council's legacy applications. Since every local authority has a huge number of legacy applications supporting digital citizen services, it's often a massive and generally costly task to untangle this legacy spaghetti. In this session, Mark and Vicky will show you how they're helping customers to deliver on digital transformation. And you can hear directly from one of their customers about how they've broken free from legacy IT. The second thing I'd like to do is to let you know how to ask a question, which we encourage. Please enter the question in the Q&A window and I'll collect the questions during the presentation to ask in the Q&A in the last 15 minutes. The session will be fully recorded for you to watch back at a later time and share. I'd now like to introduce Mark Gannon and Vicky Green who will be taking us through today's webinar. Mark is an experienced strategic leader with over 20 years experience in and around local government in digital technology and change roles with experience of delivering large, complex, multi-partner projects and IT change programmes. He has experience in managing IT service delivery in in-source and outsourced environments, including joint venture companies, and has a passion for public service, enabling organisations to deliver the best outcomes for citizens. Vicky has many years experience working in the digital and IT space, both in public and private sectors. Vicky joined Asheville District Council two years ago and is now an integral part of an exciting transformation programme. She has significant experience in managing change and solutions development. So Mark and Vicky, over to you. Thanks Lucy um, and good morning everyone. Really delighted to have you joining us here on this uh, lovely sunny day. Um, we're going to talk about um, how the digital supplier market is holding um, local government's digital transformation ambitions back um, through legacy technology. Um, but we will hear from uh, one council, Vicky's council, uh, who are innovating and using low code and intelligent automation despite the, uh, the legacy challenges. So uh, just some introductions. Um, as Lucy said, um, my name is Mark Gannon. I've been director of client solutions uh, at Netcall for um, about five months now, um, but I've worked um, in local government for around 20 years and just prior to joining Netcall, I was CIO and Director of Transformation at Sheffield City Council, where I led a significant technology transformation, moving from a very outdated um, technology infrastructure, uh, largely outsourced to a single supplier, to more modern, cost-effective, um, modern digital uh, infrastructure, cloud-first estate, um, with a great series of uh, innovative partners, and thankfully just managed to do that just in time for uh, COVID. Um, and I suppose just to underline, you know, over my 20 years experience in local government, um, there's been some frustrations for me personally uh, in terms of, you know, suppliers who who talk about partnership and talk about innovation, but actually don't really follow through on it. So it's great for me personally to be working for a company, Netcall, who share my values and share my views on what a proper local government partner looks like. Um, so I'm really pleased to be talking to you today. Um, and I'm really delighted to have Vicky Green joining me on the panel today and I'll let Vicky introduce herself. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, so um, like Lucy mentioned, um, I've worked for Ashfield District Council now for two years, um, sort of joined in the height of COVID, um, which was an experience. But um, yeah, I've uh, successfully um, been promoted up to the digital program manager role, which effectively looks after all of the digital programs within our, our transformation um, here at Ashfield, um, but specifically looks after our digital team, which was um, a newly created team that, that works with Netcall on their Liberty Create system. Um, so I've had a good um, experience and knowledge of seeing that being brought into sort of practice and 
working from the bottom up really in terms of actually using it and, and developing things and, and seeing how that call support is in helping us create those things. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so I'm just going to do a couple of obligatory slides about NetCall and, and who we are um, before we get on to the rest of the session. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the main subjects and then Vicky's going to um, talk about the journey that she and her team and the council have been on. Um, so NetCall, we, we drive digital transformation across local government. We work with more than a, a hundred councils in the UK. Um, here are some of those councils. Obviously, Ashfield is, is, is one of the councils we work for, but we, we work with a range of councils from county councils to city councils to district councils across the country. Um, and um, we also work across other sectors. So we have around 600, over 600 customers across all sectors. Um, and we've been around for 20 plus years. So, so we really kind of understand local governments um, and the challenges, but also the opportunities. And there are lots of opportunities um, within the sector. Um, so our, our core our core product um, is the, the Liberty platform, which is a um, four solutions that, that work seamlessly together. So we've got Liberty Create, which is our low code solution. Um, and Vicky will talk a little bit more about that and, and how Ashfield have been using that. Um, we've got Liberty RPA, which is our uh, powered robotic process automation solution. Liberty Converse, which is our um, uh, omni-channel contact center solution, and then Liberty Connect, our conversational messaging solution. And all of these products are underpinned by um, our AI, really powerful AI capability. And these solutions you know, give councils the ability to deliver real intelligent automation that, that makes better citizen services and, and really improves the outcomes, not just for citizens, but also for employees as well. Um, I'm going to just set some context um, and I obviously anyone here from local government will already be well aware of the challenges um, facing local government, but I think it's important just to kind of touch on those those points for context. Um, I mean, we know through the COVID pandemic just how important local government is to, to the fabric of, of, of society, you know, in building prosperous and resilient communities and the, res and, and the response to COVID-19 demonstrated really why our local government organizations are, are so important to, to local places. Uh, but they've been facing some challenges over, over the years. So, you know, some stats between March 1999 and December 2021, the numbers of employees across the whole of local government, so all the roughly 400 councils, actually reduced from 2.74 million to, to 2 million. You know, that's a, that's a three quarters of a million uh, reduction in the number of employees delivering great services to those those um, prosperous, resilient communities. Um, interestingly, there's been an almost uh, converse increase in staffing uh, in central government. There's been a similar downward trend in budgets as well. So central government's preferred um, definition is around local authority spending power, which is reduced by about 16% since 2010. But actually, if you look at core, core central government grants going to local government, the reduction has been around 37%. That's over a third of local government's budgets that have been taken away. Um, and obviously, you know, that's that's quite difficult. So we, you know, we in the 20 years that we've been supporting local government, we've seen that that impact. Um, but we've also seen how councils are responding to the challenge in really innovative ways. And, you know, I'm not just saying this because I've had a career in local government, but some of the greatest innovation I've ever seen has come from local government in trying to, you know, deliver great services against those challenges. Um, Citizen expectations um, have also increased. And I think, you know, the brilliant response that local government delivered during the COVID-19 pandemic only served to kind of increase those expectations even further because citizens were able to get services, you know, uh, in that kind of period where, you know, they needed it quick, they needed it online in lots of cases and were able to get it and councils responded brilliantly. But that's just increased um, citizen expectations who, to be honest, rightly are expecting services to be in the same style, quality, speed of, you know, their favorite um, digitally enabled businesses, choose, choose your favorite. Um, but the other aspect here is, I think the, the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated that actually with hybrid working and the ability for, for people to essentially work from anywhere if they want to, um, potentially, um, 
that, that actually giving council employees the tools that they need to do their jobs well is really important um, because you know council staff have have some choices now in terms of location that they didn't have previously. Um, uh, in terms of data, Lucy mentioned it in the introduction. Um, you know, um, data and the ability to move it in and out of applications um, seamlessly and friction free is fundamentally the thing that drives and is the key to unlocking great digital services for citizens. Um, but you know, my view is very strongly that, that that data is often trapped, and and I would be as strong as to say, kind of held captive in in those legacy applications because you know those th those legacy applications um, and some of those legacy vendors make it really hard for councils to extract that data in a meaningful way. And you know, if those four hundred councils across the country with all those really big chunky legacy applications, some front office, some back office, can't get that data out. It's really, really tough to, to deliver those great digital services. Um, and, you know, the legacy technology, um, you know, the local digital declaration um, called, called for, you know, to fix the plumbing. Um, and, and we agree with that. Um, we think that that's a great um, uh, thing to, to address. But sadly, much of the, the local government solutions market, um, I think, are hindering, not helping. Um, and unfortunately, they do this by providing applications that are often just not fit for or agile enough for the modern digital era. Um, and they just serve to maintain those legacy technologies, systems, processes and commercial models, um, which just create silos for local government. Um, and we think local authorities are being let down um, and we think that needs to change. Um, so, you know. If, if those are the challenges in local governments, digital transformation is already really hard against that backdrop, um, especially with that legacy spaghetti that, that councils have to contend with. Um, so, you know, and, and here's a common list of, for anybody who's worked in local authority IT and digital over the years, you know, here are the list of challenges. Um, and it's really, really tough. Um, so we think that there needs to be a, a different approach to this um, and enabling that, end-to-end -end digital transformation in local authorities is already hard enough. And sometimes it's impossible with some of those legacy solutions and legacy providers, um, which just in, um, just um, don't enable that end-to-end -end digital transformation for councils um, who need to do it. So we're on a mission, NetCall is on a mission, and we have a manifesto for local government, which is available on our website. Um, and our mission is simple. We, we will put the power of digital transformation back into the hands of local authorities and enable their digital autonomy. And the problem with legacy applications that, that aren't designed for the modern digital era um, can prevent councils from you know, making progress on their digital ambitions. I've experienced that in, in my 20 years um, and I've experienced the frustrations of having to try and you know, work around those legacy applications and legacy suppliers. Um, but actually tools like low code and RPA are now giving councils the ability to to get around those issues and surface that data, um, extract it from systems and move it around the organization to deliver those brilliant end-to-end -end, um, digital services. And actually those tools are also um, facilitating councils to, to use their own skills and to develop their own internal capability without having to be reliant on external suppliers or you know, coders that are, that are really, really hard to find. Um, so for us, it's about building the digital autonomy of councils and, and putting that power into their hands. So as part of our manifesto for local government, um, we've got eight areas that, that we are going to focus on to make sure that we are um, delivering towards our mission. Um, and I'll just briefly touch on each of these. Um, I, you know, really love it if you wanted to go and read the manifesto in, in detail and, and sort of find out a bit more about each of these. But essentially, you know, the first one is about, you know, giving councils the tools that they need to do in the first place. You know, the amount of really poor solutions available, um, both legacy solutions, but also um, some existing solutions on the market. Um, you know, when I, when I was a CIO, um, I was forever frustrated at that. Um, you know, I expect the best, best tools possible to be given to me because, you know, councils are investing lots and lots of money with suppliers and you know should expect the best tools to allow them to transform and i think you know the tools that help councils to build their capability rather than undermine their capability is really important so 
you know, we work with councils who are finding that with the tools that we provide, they can now um, develop their staff and nurture that talent. And we work really hard with councils across the country to do that as well. Um, and actually taking people who pot potentially working in a different part of the organization, but, you know, are able to, to with, a, with you know, uh, not very much training, um, be able to develop really good digital services and solutions using using products like our low code product. Um, and actually, you know, there's there's a bit of a ch challenge with skills in local government. We did a survey where over half of the hundred authorities we asked said that they struggled with the skills to be able to develop um, good digital services. Um, tools like low code and RPA are, are changing that. Um, and hopefully Vicky will touch on some of that um, when she talks. Um, collaboration, sharing, reuse. You know, it it increases massively the the pace of change, um, and there I think there is a growing sense within local government digital communities uh, of the importance of working together um, as as a local government community. And there are some brilliant examples like you know local government Drupal, where a group of councils are sharing you know common code to to fast track digital transformation, and and we love that, and we think that's brilliant for local government it's brilliant for citizens and it's brilliant for employees because it's quicker it's faster it's cheaper um, and you know you've got a peer network of people that you can turn to for support you know there's something about affordable solutions with um, fair and transparent pricing um, uh, you know I'm not going <laughs> to talk about any specifics here but you know some of the larger um, vendors who service local government um, some of their licensing is really really complicated to understand and you know often you, you you need a degree just in order to work out what you need to budget for the next three or four years um and you know we just we just don't think that's right you know councils are under a lot of pressure and should be able to understand simple licensing arrangements so that they can budget um and you know you look at so our liberty create um low code platform is site-based so actually you know, once the council's got that, they can build as much as they want and deploy as much as they want for a single single um, price. Um, and we just think that's 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 how it should be. Um, building solutions that are open, um, you know, with open standards, with integrations that are widely available. You know, one of the biggest frustrations I ever had in local government was was trying to use solutions that that were just um, um, islands, really. Um, islands of technology that didn't connect to anything and, and to try and get them to connect to other things was either impossible or really expensive um, and actually without that you can't drive those good end-to-end -end services you know and number six is about innovation you know councils should be getting the latest innovations um, and they shouldn't have to pay for every new thing that comes along and, you know our approach is to is to work with councils to develop the things they that you know that they are asking for the things that are important to them, um, and you know that there's a partnership there and, and actually you know constantly innovating is a really important part of being a good supplier. And then listening to those customers, you know we we work really closely with customers um, and and their needs are changing all the time. You know despite what some people might think, local governments um, changes really really fast and really quickly. Um, the legislation, you know, that, that local government has to consume and then push out is um, is putting lots of challenges on them and having to, you know, so so we listen to our customers and, and constantly try and make sure that our solutions um, are delivering what they need. But but the fundamental point for, for our, our manifesto and our mission is focusing relentlessly on that citizen impact, you know, I love technical solutions that solve problems. Um, that's why I do what I do. But if those if those solutions don't fundamentally impact on citizen outcomes, then you know we're not doing the right job and we're not um, delivering the right solutions. So um, I think it's constantly checking what we do as a company to make sure that we're delivering against our mission and these objectives. But fundamental measure is: are we helping customers to improve citizen impact? So that's 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 our manifesto and that's what we believe in and that's what we're going to work really hard to deliver you know i'm not going to say we're going to get it right all the time but but we are serious about this and we will we will work with customers across the country to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable um so that's all i want to say i'm going to hand over to to, to vicky now who hopefully will um will reflect back some of those points um in her <laughs> presentation 
Thanks, Mark. Um, okay, um, thank you. Um, so I don't know how many of you probably know much about Ashfield, but we're a relatively small council in the sort of middle of the Nottinghamshire area, so in the Midlands. Um, we've got a population of around 130,000 people, um, probably a bit less than that, um, and it covers the main areas of Kirkby, Sutton in Ashfield and Hucknall, um, and, and work very closely with Mansfield District Council, which again is part of the wider Nottinghamshire um, area. So if you could just move to the next slide, please, Mark. So some of the challenges that we have are, like I've said, we are a relatively small um, district council. We've got a limited amount of resources, um, both within sort of um, our digital team, um, but also within the council as a whole. So um, within our service areas, you, we, you, we've got people that are doing sort of hybrid jobs, um, looking after different systems, um, having jobs doing different, different areas of work. We've also got a lot of legacy systems that are sort of costing us a lot of money. Um, and we're very reliant um, on those suppliers helping us work those legacy systems. And we're very much um, held to account really in terms of upgrades um, which we know that we need to do. We've got a, um, um, a strategy going forward that we want to move um, as much as we can to the cloud where possible um, and a lot of those legacy systems don't allow us to do that. And we've also got a lot of silo working so when we originally um, developed uh, the digital team. What we wanted to actually do is bring the digital transformation of all of our services area together so that we can work together as one big team rather than individual silo departments um, purchasing their own systems, um, not really speaking to each other. And then we've got this disparate um, sort of information going on. Um, so what we wanted to do was empower those employees to be able to look after their own systems, but also um, we wanted to engage with our customers as well. So that was one of the main reasons we, we looked out to um, something uh, like a system that uh, uh, like Liberty Create for Netcall, but I'll talk about that on the next slide. If you could just move on. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so why did we choose Netcall originally? So um, at the time, um, I wasn't here at the time, but we did go out and we had a look at a number of different solutions. We wanted something that was going to give us that single view of a customer. So where Mark's talked about the different products that Netcall have that are available, we've got the, the Liberty Create, we've got Liberty Converse, we've previously looked at um, Liberty Connect as well. We wanted to be able to get to a point in the future where we've got a single view of our customer. And we believed that the Netcall solution would enable us to actually get, get that information for us. We also looking out at the market, um, one of the things that attracted us to Netcall and the Liberty Create solution was the fact that we would be able to um, have control of our internal development. So we'd be able to get rid of some of those legacy systems and do all of our internal development, not necessarily on every system, but some of the, the smaller systems that we believe that are costing us um, a lot of money, but not actually giving us a lot of value, um, we'd be able to develop those internally. And as Mark referred to, um, one of the key reasons as well was we'd be able to use the sort of talent and skills of our current and existing employees. So we've actually got somebody within the digital team. She doesn't actually come from a technical background, um, but she's able to um, pick up Liberty Create and have the initial training. Um, and she was able to hit the ground running with that in terms of um, using a low code solution to be able to develop some of these solutions. Um, Netcall's very big on, and, and Mark's mentioned it as well, on sort of like the, the community and their sharing and their collaboration. So what we did like was the fact that we would be able to um, be part of that community with other councils in terms of sharing good practice, um, sharing um, apps potentially that are then made available on the app share and taking advantage of Netcall's um, solutions that they make available um, on the app share as well. Um, and, and as I've mentioned before, use the existing council resources, but 
not only within the existing digital team, but also um, having people from our service areas um, being able to be what we call them as agents and being able to do more of that hands on um, and tweaking of systems than they would naturally be if we were with any other suppliers for a solution. If you could just move on, Mark, that would be great. Thank you. OK, so um, I thought we, we did purchase um, Liberty Create probably a couple of years ago now, um, but we didn't really start using it in anger until probably, I would say, 15 months ago. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a slow burner. And I think that was mainly I was I'll come to the lessons learned um, at the end of the presentation. But I think it was having the right people in the in, in the right team available. And that was where we um, just have, have learned a lesson in that respect. But what we decided we wanted to do was replace a number of our sort of online customer facing type forms that we had on our website. So we'd got a lot of report it forms um, pay it, apply for it. Um, and we wanted to um, have a consistent approach with them. So we wanted to start replacing all of those within um, Liberty Create. So we focused on the key ones that we'd got in our waste and environment system um, and, um, and, and made those available as uh, anonymous. And in the background as well, in parallel to this, we were working on our Ashfield 24-7, which is our, the Citizen Hub um, portal. Um, and um, this allows people um, and residents to create an account um, and have all of their details saved and they can view um, their cases that they've um, submitted. Um, and what it also does is provide an, an integration to our back office system, Whitespace, in order to have real time updates for the resident to know when their request is being um, dealt with or when it's been closed or if there's more information required for it. Um, we've recently started replacing some of those small systems that I'd mentioned. So we um, we were paying for a, a help desk solution, but we've actually um, created now this in, in, in our Liberty Create system. So um, we've got rid of the supplier with regards to that and our IT um, are fully using that and have come back with some, some tweaks that are needed. Um, so it's a continuous improvement approach that. We've developed um, the um, complaints and complement system. Um, and that now means that residents can and fill in an online form and it automatically um, submits that to the, to the relevant department for that complaint or um, um, complement to be actioned. And again, using um, a similar type of uh, citizens hub format that resident will get then real-time updates to any of their um, information. We've also developed, a, a, it's quite a small system called the Business Supplier Directory, but it enables um, suppliers within the district, district to submit their details um, and um, meaning that if anyone in the council wants to actually use um, those suppliers, they've got all of their information um, and we can validate those suppliers. So we know that you, you're, you're getting the best out of those suppliers. So if we just move on to the next one, please, Mark. So this is just um, a snapshot really of what our portal Asheville 24-7 looks like. So like I say, this was our first iteration. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had a number of different services available in it before we went live to residents. So um, we didn't want one or two because it would discourage people from signing up. So I think initially we put 12 um, service requests in there. So people, if they put their information in, in terms of their address, can also see their bin calendar. They can apply for a free bulky waste collection. because That's something that Ashfield are doing at the minute. Um, and they can also report things like uh, dog fouling, um, graffiti, street sweeping, et cetera. They can also change their details within there. Um, and um, as I'm gonna come on to sort of like things in the future, these are the sorts of things that we'll just be developing on more and more and, and filling up the portal with different um, services that will be available to residents. Thanks, Mark. So at the minute, I think we went live in February with Asheville 24-7, February of this year. Uh, we've 
got in the region of 1700 um, accounts with uh, residents registered on there. We did a relatively soft launch um, approach to that in terms of um, we um, advertised it on our web on the front page, um, but we didn't really do um, a lot of marketing on it because we wanted to just make sure that people were getting the right level of service to start with um, and it was relatively new to us. Um, I think in hindsight this is something that I think we could have marketed a little bit more um, but by the by we've got 1700 accounts so I think that's been pretty successful. Um, in the last year we've had um, 5200 form submissions so this will be the anonymous forms that we've had and also any forms that have been submitted within Ashfield 24-7 as well. Um, and what that actually means as well is we've we've looked at the, the figures for the telephone calls and emails that are coming into our waste and environment system. And we've seen a reduction in those calls and email requests. So actually, when we do a review of that, um, we can see actually that there's been some savings with regards to those telephone calls and um, emails coming in. Some of the benefits that we've realised obviously the, this year, um, last year, sorry, we had a reduction in software costs of um, just over 4K. We've got estimated savings in software costs again with some of the things that we're developing or have developed um, of just short of 30,000. Um, with regards to service reviews that are ongoing because of all the digital um, solutions that we've been creating within Liberty Create, we'll see some estimated savings there in next year and the year after. Um, again, our complaint system, so once we start going into the next year, um, the, the costs we'll see um, of, of 5,000. And then in a couple of years time where we want to get to is our CRM, um, fully functioning CRM, and we anticipate that there'll be some savings of 50,000 that we can make um, by doing everything um, with our Liberty Create system. So if you just want to move to the next one, Mark, thank you. So in terms of our digital roadmap, this is very, um, very brief. Um, we want to continue that our next steps are continuing to digitize the forms in the back end so and and do all the integration with white space but also we're looking at integrating into our payment system um it just so happens that we're actually getting a new payment system at the minute as well so um it adds an extra complication um to that but we believe that actually by integrating with payments um we'll get a lot more signups to our um, Asheville 24-7 and that will continue our vision of getting that single customer view. We've got a number of different internal system developments on the horizon as well so we're currently looking at sports pitch bookings, we're focusing on um, grass pitches at the minute but that when intended once we've gone live with that we'll develop that further and, and look at um, other systems and again we're going to integrate into access control systems so that rather than the resident coming in and picking up keys, um, we'll have that fully um, integrated API with an access control system for that. Um, the single customer view is something that we need to do quite a lot more discovery work on. Um, but like I say, we've already got Liberty Converse, we've got Liberty Create, we're working with our customer services department to for them to become fully functioning agents within Liberty Create. So when we have a customer um, phone up um, using our Converse system, we should be able to see the details of the customer within Create um, and, and see whether they've not um, whether they've submitted any cases, we can offer advice, we can offer to say, well, I see you've not signed up for your Bing calendar, would you like to do that? So the more features that we bring into that, the more um, added value that we can give to the resident um, for that single customer view. And then it's the continuous improvement. So as with all of these things, the more we build within Liberty Create, the more that they're going to need that continuous improvement. Um, along the way um, and that might mean that we have to look at the at, at the team um, and, and develop the team and the structure um, but that's something that we've anticipated for and it's that that constant maintenance and that continuous improvement of that 
Uh, yep, thank you, Mark. So, um, lessons learned, I, I touched on it previously, but I think that the first lesson that we learned, I think, when we went live with Liberty was having the right capacity, having the right team in place. Um, we, like I say, we're a relatively small team, um, but we need you. You need to have the right people at the right time, um, and that was something that we learned because we we actually didn't have the right people to start with, um, and um, that's that's what I would um, recommend to anyone um, who is using Liberty Create that you you need to have those those right people in place and potentially people like within the team like a somebody to manage all of the projects somebody to do all the business analysis speak with the the, the departments understand what their needs are and then they can bring those back to the developers I'd also recommend that you have a blueprint um, of where you want to be potentially in 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 the three years um, going forward um, I think to start with we were kind of blindly just thinking right okay we'll get some forms done and, and then we had things coming in from left field and priorities changed if you've got your blueprint and written down um, you know what your priorities are you can work around everything else and then you know when you need to bring in more people to actually respond to everything that's coming in um, so you need to be responsive. Um, like I say, yes, OK, you've got the blueprint, but actually, you know that you're going to have people coming in just wanting. Um, we've had examples of digital solutions being asked for that haven't been in that blueprint. Um, and it, it's a case of actually is where's the benefits for doing that? If the benefits are outweighing doing other things, then you need to change your um, um, priorities basically but it's not being afraid of having to be responsive because you know that that's going to happen um and that is something that i think the, the team weren't aware of um but it took a while for them to get their head around that um communication i think is very key in terms of um uh, especially when you've got a team of um developers who are all working on different things they need to talk to each other regularly they need to know what each other's working on especially in a system like liberty create um if you've got people working in in different aspects of it changing different things um we've had examples where um people have worked on something and, and pushed it up through the environments um, while somebody else has still been working in the same thing and it's pushed their changes. So communication is really, really key and having those right policies and procedures in place for, even though it's low code, it's it's not no code. Um, and you, you, you would benefit from having some sort of software development type of um, policies um, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page basically. And the other thing is knowing when to ask for help because Netcall are always, always available. Um, we, you've got the, the community forum, you've got um, other people from the councils that, you know, are always willing to sort of answer any questions. I think that was one thing that we are really, really pleased about in the fact that we know that if you ask a question, um, you will get a response and you'll get that help that's needed. Um, um, and I would say, yeah, the count, all the councils working together have been absolutely brilliant and Netcall support has been, has been spot on. So couldn't fault that at all, but it's just remembering that they are there to help. So just ask the questions when needed. And I think that's it from me. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Vicky. Um, and thanks for, um... Thanks for your honest uh, reflection there. I know it's um, I know it's been a kind of slightly bumpy journey, but um, I think that kind of learning mindset is really important. And I, you know, I appreciate you sharing that because it's it's not easy to kind of do that sometimes. So thanks for that. No, definitely. And I, I just think, yeah, some of the, some of those points are definitely down down to us um, in, in terms of Ashfield and the council. Um, but it, it is like those learning curves, isn't it? It's, it's you're never going to get things right the first time. But I think if yeah. you can share that experience with others, then then that's great. Yeah, indeed. Um, so I'm just going to just kind of summarise now, um, and then we might have time for a couple of questions. Um, 
so obviously, you know, you've you've heard you've heard from Vicky and you've heard the, the journey that um, she and her team and Ashfield have been on. Um, I mean, you know, anybody working in local government understands the pressures. You know, we've talked about budgets. Vicky's touched on 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 that in her presentation, and you know, often digital teams working in local government are quite small teams. You know, often under resourced. Um, there's maybe a question about do senior leaders in local government understand what digital really is? Um, um, you know, are 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 they funding um, projects or are they funding teams, um, digital teams to deliver? So there's a whole there's probably a whole webinar about, about that. Um, but you know, local government is is incredibly resilient um, despite the pressure, despite the legacy tech that you know I think is is often holding them back and is often preventing them from doing what they need to do. But, you know, you've heard from Vicky how, you know, even small incremental changes to applications, internal applications, citizen facing applications is possible. And, you know, um, taking on board some of the lessons that, that Vicky's mentioned today is really important, not just for councils that, that use low code, but any council that's delivering digital services. But fundamentally it comes back to, to my, the point that I started with, which is, I think it's really important that councils with with the pressures and with the challenges have that autonomy and aren't reliant on um external expensive um potentially ex expensive suppliers um you know vicky and the team when they're in the stride can make changes in days and weeks rather than you know um months um so so that's really really important um and uh if if that's resonated with you then you know do um, continue the conversation there's my email address and there's vicky's email address and you know we're, we're more than happy to to talk about you know um any of the stuff that you've heard today um and i would you know be delighted if you went and had a look at the um manifesto on our, on our website um i think that's it i'm going to stop sharing my screen now um and lucy i think it's going to come back yeah yes well, excellent. Thank you so much, Vicky and Mark, for that insightful presentation. It's been really interesting to hear some of your learnings, so thank you. We do now have a little bit of time for some questions, not very much, um, and there have been a couple that have been sent through. So there's one here from Manish. He's saying, thanks for the presentation. Do the solutions you build into one council, e.g. Ashfield, ever successfully make it into other councils? Brackets, which presumably saves these other councils a ton of cash. Uh, yeah, um, they they do. I mean, that's that's that comes back to the point I made around sharing and reuse. Um, um, and you know, Vicky mentioned the app share in the community. So, so um, many of our councils have developed. There's some great examples of during COVID some of the business grants um, applications that um, I think Cumbria developed and Croydon have developed, and other councils just took those applications and used those. So. So yeah, it does save other councils a lot of money and a lot of time as well. So it's not just the it's not just the cost of the thing; it's the time and the cost of that development. Um, yeah. And the other thing as well is, you know, if it doesn't quite fit exactly what you need because it's built on a local platform, you can just tweak and you can take, you know, your own customer feedback and just make it exactly what you need. Because not every council is exactly the same, but they might be eighty percent the same. Yeah, I can reiterate that. The um, We have downloaded some of the other apps from that other councils have developed. And although, like Mark says, they don't actually fit perfectly, they they you, you can do a few tweaks without starting from scratch and that saves a lot of time. So yeah, that it, it is really useful to have. Brilliant, okay, thank you. Uh, so another question here from Millie. Have you had a look at how staff satisfaction has increased or what mechanisms would you think about using KPIs, et cetera? Are we, I'm assuming she's talking about staff, staff, staff satisfaction within the council, although I'm not quite sure whether she means within the digital team or with it, the council in general. Um, I think we haven't actually done anything specific here in Ashfield, um, but the feedback that we do get from the rest of the services areas is they like the fact in terms of that they were working in their own silos initially, and they like the fact that they're work, we're working more with them um, and, based, and, and getting solutions based on their needs rather than what IT or digital think that the, the, the 
organization needs and it's more about what they actually want and need so we've had positive feedback in that way but we've not done any specific kpis now i think just just to add to, to vicky's point i mean we um we have we have we obviously work with over 100 councils um I mean, some of the, some of the areas. So there's a mixture of KPIs that you can use. You know, there's the sort of harder ones like total cost of ownership and return on investment. And actually, the figures for those are astounding on low code. Um, you know, if you look at Vicky's um, table with the with the, the figures in there. Um, I mean, essentially, the total cost of ownership reduces incrementally every time you use it. Every time you decommission another application or a license in it, it reduces. Um, and that and that's good. So the finance people. Um, their satisfaction is very high with that. Um, um, but if you look at um, if you look at how the solutions integrate and help those kind of end to end flows, that's the bit. You know, if you're if you're in a contact center and you have to open seven or eight windows and pop in and out of different applications to answer a customer query, I mean, you know, that's that's horrific for for contact center staff. If you've got it as Vicky's ambition is to have it all in one place, then then that satisfaction as a as a contact employee is is massively increased. Um, mm. And there was a great example at Croydon where um, I think the chief ex or the assistant chief executive had asked for a piece of software to be upgraded and just had assumed that it was going to be weeks and months. Mm. And actually, um, the the team there came back the next day with the upgrade and it was it was it was like some kind of weird magic. Um, mm. So so yeah. Um, I think satisfaction can can be improved, but I think it's a really great point about KPIs. Amazing, great. Well, I'm really sorry. I know there's a, there's a few more questions, but we are we are out of time, I'm afraid. Um, so thank you so much to Vicky and Mark for that insightful presentation, and um, thank you all so much for tuning in. The recording of this will be on week.digileaders.com on the same talk page that you registered for and you'll also be emailed a link to the recording later on today and you'll be able to share that link with colleagues and watch it back at your leisure. So thank you so much again, we hope to see you soon. If you have any more questions, Mark and Vicky, would you be happy to be contacted? Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great. Okay, thanks very much yeah. everyone. Thanks, Lucy. Thank thanks you. everyone.